if you fail to protect your information, you're not just, it's not, this is not about opposition research. This is about if you can't protect your information now, how can I trust you to protect very sensitive information later when you're in a position of power? This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to Outer Upper Office Podcast from My Campaign Coach. I'm really excited about this week's episode, not just because we have a phenomenal guest to talk about the timely topic of cybersecurity in your campaign. It's also because this week marks the end of our first full year publishing this podcast. Over the last 52 episodes, I've had a blast, and we're not going to stop anytime soon. The first month on iTunes, we just had 280 total downloads. And I'll be honest, the fact that I had more than just family members downloading made me ecstatic. But over the last three months, we've averaged over 4,000 downloads a month, and we're only climbing up from there. And y'all's support has been wonderful, and I've been really excited to hear from listeners who are running for office or helping campaigns and putting lessons they've learned here to use winning their races. Something else has happened over the last year is an elevation of the discussion around cybersecurity and political campaigns. This isn't just going to be an episode about how the Russians did or did not hack our elections. It's going to be about helping you make your campaign a harder target, securing your data, securing your information, and making sure that you can't be caught up in any kind of hacking or phishing attempt. It's really big topics that, like these that we're talking about this week. And so we brought on a guest that I know well, that you may have seen on your TV, that's a rock star, Morgan Wright. He's an internationally recognized expert on cybersecurity strategy, cyber terrorism, identity theft, and privacy. He currently serves as a senior fellow at the Center for Digital Government and is an advisor to the Congressional House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Morgan Wright's landmark testimony before Congress on the failures of the healthcare.gov website changed how the government collects personally identifiable information. He's a familiar face on Fox News and has made hundreds of appearances on TV and radio, in print, and around the web. He's worked for the State Department and spent 18 years in state and local law enforcement and developed solutions in defense, justice, and intelligence for the largest technology companies in the world. Morgan and I have become close friends over the last year or so, and I've learned an incredible amount from him, and I want to help bring some of that information to the table to help you secure your campaign. If you employ these lessons he shares today, your campaign will be confident in the security, and you can focus on your goal of winning your election. Morgan, welcome to the podcast. Hey, first of all, Raz, thank you. Congrats, Dad. Uh, you forgot to tell everybody. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, just, I just passed the one month mark with this little guy, William Stonewall, and I'm actually getting a remarkably normal amount of sleep now. It's great. Ah, yeah, it changes. Don't worry. You know, kids kids get more expensive the older they get. Uh, Trust I've, me. I'm already so. believing that. The medical bills and all the different random things you got to buy to outfit the place. It's, uh, yeah, I, I can only imagine it's going to get more and more expensive as time goes on. And here's the thing. Your kid will grow up not knowing anything else other than a mobile device in their hand, you know, and I'm not saying that that's what you do it with them. But, you know, when, when I grew up, it was three channels on the TV. Now we're talking about a mobile device in the hand that has more power than, than the Apollo uh, uh, when we landed on the moon than the Apollo lander had in it. The Apollo, it only took 384K of RAM oh to put gosh. a man on the moon. So, I mean, because that's kind of crazy. You know, we were laughing before we started the, started recording, talking about how you're a cybersecurity expert, and yet the idea of any type of cyber anything didn't really even exist even when you were starting out your law enforcement career. Oh, no, no. And, and the word cyber really didn't get involved in this until, you know, it's more of a term of art. When I first started really working in this area, and it was right before the big denial of service attacks in 2000, February of 2000, we were calling it InfoSec, information security. Well, it was, you know, what we realized, it's more than just about the information. Mm -hmm. It's about the network and the devices and the people. So, right. you know, they started they started trying to come up with names. It was InfoSec for a while, but then really it started becoming cyber, you know, as we started talking about cyberspace. And I think the discussion really got started too, Raz, is when the Air Force declared cyberspace to be the fifth domain. We had sea, mm -hmm. air, land, and space. Now they consider it a combatant command. Uh, cyberspace is the fifth domain where we will engage, you know, in warfare with our adversaries. So, you know, it's 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 a huge issue now, and it's not going to go away. And quite frankly, with all the people I've seen down at Fox over the years, I've seen presidential candidates. I've talked with them. I've seen people running for office, senators. There is nobody. I promise you, nobody who worries more about their reputation and what people think of them than politicians. And if you mm -hmm. don't get this right. 
you're going to be uh, the next poster child like John Podesta. Oh, absolutely. Well, and before we get to Podesta, because I, I really want to talk a lot about him and use him as kind of a case study of what not to do since he's been in the news, especially this last yep. week. But let's let's kind of go a little bit more into your background, kind of where you came from, what got you involved in law enforcement, and kind of how you got to be where you're at, and leading us up to being on Fox News this morning and stuff like that. It was real simple. Um, I, I came, I saw, I conquered. Isn't that what you did? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you did. Yeah, that's what it is. No, actually, um, you know, my, my dad was military. I was born on a military base, Fort Riley, Kansas. We moved around the world, lived in Iran for three years. I grew up as a kid speaking Farsi, um, ended up back in Kansas. You know, and I, I was actually musically inclined. I was a music major, went to college on a music scholarship. But a state trooper by the name of Ken Massey would come into the little stop and rob where I worked. And he said, hey, finally one night he said, hey, you want to go out for a ride? I said, sure. And then I was hooked. I loved it. I love the idea, uh, you know, with that, I was also in uh, the U.S. Army Reserves, ROTC, but I love the idea of the law enforcement. So, you know, it kind of took off from there. I started off just a little, little old street cop in Salina, Kansas, and then I went to the state patrol. And But what was interesting is uh, I got my first computer while I was a trooper, and I really started getting involved with it because I was really a lazy at heart. I mean uh, – <laughs> And here's why. I mean, some of the formulas we would use to reconstruct accidents were very long. We had energy crush formulas. We had conservation of linear momentum. Yeah. Well, if you handwrite those things out and you change one variable, you got to go back through and recompute everything. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, this is a waste of time. So I taught myself basic. I had a Tandy 1000 SL uh, or XL. No, Tandy 1000 XL running DOS 3.3 at that time, you know, and it just taught myself basic. We started creating these programs. And then one thing led to another. I went to my first computer crime investigation course in 1993. Wow. Um, yeah, way back when, back when uh, hard drives were only about, uh, you know, 40 megabytes because you had a 32 mm -hmm. meg uh, limitation uh, with DOS and then an eight meg additional drive you could uh, do with uh, D drive. So, but yeah, we were using Norton disk editor, but I mean, that's where you started. But I started sticking with that, but interestingly enough, I stayed involved in the human behavioral side of it too, because I was as a detective, I taught, I did a lot of interview and interrogation. I went through training with the first members of the behavioral science unit for the FBI. One of my instructors, a guy named William Peters, and uh, so there was always this intersection between the behavioral aspects and the technology. You, you can't divorce one from the other. Right. Uh, ended up teaching out at the NSA to uh, the damage assessment agents from the Alder James, Harold James Nicholson, uh, Earl Edwin Pitts espionage cases. And there was technology involved in that. I mean, Alder James had a Palm Pilot that was encrypted. Um, and even the NSA couldn't break the encryption on that. He had wow. messages that were um, – yeah, and, and I don't know to this day. I mean, there was a while back there to where he had refused to give up some information. Um, but yeah, they hadn't been able, even using the Cray computers, because that was the level of encryption that was actually available in the commercial world. So all of this stuff was fascinating to me. And so I stay involved in this. Um, but, you know, things being what they are, I started branching out a little bit more, got some opportunities. I ran Microsoft's anti piracy program for a year and a half. Um, and then I spent a year training the FBI's CART team, which stands for Computer Analysis Response Team. I trained them for an entire year uh, how to conduct Internet investigations. I was actually the person that got the FBI started down the road to conduct Internet investigations. And uh, then about 2000, you know, I moved out to Virginia. Actually, before that, I was commuting back and forth, but I was working for one of the defense contractors. We were doing work in the intelligence community, the defense, uh, doing information security, you know, helping these guys – protect this stuff. And, uh, and then, um, uh, nine 11 happened. And before nine 11, I was actually working in Columbia, Plan Columbia again, involving how do we secure data? They had tons of information down there on narco traffickers on seized assets, and they had to worry about protecting it because literally just like it, just like, uh, you've seen maybe the Netflix uh, series narcos, which by the way, Steve Murphy guy who was made about was my neighbor down here in oh, uh, really? Virginia. Yeah. Uh, good friend of mine introduced me to him. We out, went out and had coffee a few years ago before the Narcos thing was even a, a, a concept. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But, hey, you know, again, it all goes back to it was the security of information. Uh, back then it was, hey, I'll give you $20,000 and here's the information I want or we're going to kill your whole family. So, you know, a challenge I'd never had to deal with. And so these guys, it was very real to them. Um, post 9-11, did a lot of work in the counterintelligence field activity, joint counterintelligence assessment group. A lot of this was around large amounts of data. Number one, how do we secure it? But number two, how do we derive intelligence out of it to identify bad actors, bad people? Right. Um, went from there, um, 
did a lot of work with technology companies. I ran a very large information sharing program down at the Department of Justice for a couple of years, helped develop the plans. Um, I was, uh, when I was at Cisco Systems, the technology company, not the food company, some people, so I tell them I work for Cisco, they say, you do the public safety <laughs> for Cisco? Now, uh, but, uh, so that's when I got hooked up. I was doing, I was a senior advisor for the U.S. State Department Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program. We would go out into countries like Pakistan and Turkey, uh, Kenya, all of these different places around the world and help these guys build up their technical expertise, their capability, because that was the one thing they lacked. They really needed it. I mean, we had people exchanging sensitive information using a hotmail.com email address. Come on, oh, sweet Lord. please, you can't do that. And then, you know, just kind of, you know, fast forwarding through that. I mean, I stayed involved with that. I've been doing been Fox for 14 years now. Um, actually, I started doing media back in the big denial of service attacks uh, when CNN was taken down, Yahoo, eBay. Mm -hmm. We put out a press release that morning saying, hey, we know how to investigate these things. That afternoon it happens. Now Congress wants to know what do we know, when do we know it, all that good stuff. Yeah. And uh, it just kind of blossomed, you know, into this. I was, uh, like I said, a good opportunity at Cisco, went around the world, well, dealt with a lot of governments, militaries, law enforcement agencies, uh, essentially about how to protect uh, their information, their data. Because look, Raz, you know, one of the things is, one of the things decision makers need is data. They have to be able mm -hmm. to make decisions. Right. But sometimes you have to be comfortable making decisions based on imperfect information. But how much can I trust that information? So, you know, a lot of this is about how do we get the right data in the right format to the right person at the right time so that they can make that decision. And the, the, the longer it takes to get the decision, the more risk there is that something's going to happen. So real big push to tightening and shortening that decision-making cycle. You know, how do we, how do we uh, shorten the, uh, you know, really get down to that decision-making loop, you know, increase the speed and precision of the decision-making loop. So that's, but that's why you have to protect this information because if I can inject anything into that process and make you not trust it, I can effectively disrupt your communications, your collaboration, your ability to operate. So Kind of went forward from that. I uh, was an executive at a technology company. We had to lay off 347 people. I said, never going to go back and do that again. So for the last five years, i kind of been a portfolio guy. I do a little bit of everything, keynote speeches, et cetera. I know I went on a little bit longer, but you wanted the short version. That well, was no, the no, short version. This is perfect. You want the long version? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the short version will do. I, you know, <laughs> your, your resume speaks for itself, but it's, it's really cool when you get to talk to somebody like you that has, has really been on the cutting edge of this from, from day one. Yeah, I love that it started out with being a you know lazy cop that didn't want to run formulas by hand. <laughs> That's pretty funny, but it's it's really cool seeing you know all that you've been able to do, having the sexy black passport and getting to go around and do stuff in the State Department and just that your your resume is really incredible. And as part of your your staying up to date on all this stuff, which is a is a full time job in and of itself, just making sure you're you're staying on that cutting edge. You know, you've been in the middle of, of looking at and commentating on a lot of the stuff that's been coming out in the last year with the allegations of Russians yep. hacking and, and doing the stuff in the elections. And one of the guys near the center of that is John Podesta. So talk to us a little about that, because some folks may have seen his name in the news recently. Uh, and so kind of talk through what actually happened with him, why his name's in the news and what that case study can teach us about helping secure our campaigns. Sure. So uh, one quick aside, I was actually at Fox News headquarters. They brought me up there um, for election night. So I was in the brand new newsroom. I was there with all the people from Brett Baer to Megyn Kelly to Tucker Carlson. I mean, Ed, Charles, Cry Any, anybody who's been on Fox that could weigh in on this. I mean, I had a good chance to talk with a lot of people. Mike Huckabee. It was a really great time to be able to talk to these folks. No doubt. And and, you know, one of the neat things about this was, is being up there, is I do ones and zeros, not R's and D's. A lot of people are politically involved. Look, a one and zero, I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, you need to be responsible with your information. Because the, the you the Podesta, and we're, we're, this is, leads into Podesta, if you fail to protect your information, you're not just, it's not, this is not about opposition research. This is about if you can't protect your information now, how can I trust you to protect very sensitive information later when you're in a position of power, which is one of mm -hmm. the issues with Hillary Clinton and Huma Abedin and all these other folks that right. were letting uh, – because I, you know, I held a security clearance. I held a top secret clearance. Uh, as a professional, I was offended that people would treat the information this way. Absolutely. But it's got to start somewhere, and I will tell you this, Raz. Here's the, here's the punchline to John Podesta. If you have bad habits in your personal life, you will have bad habits in your professional life. Absolutely. And this is exactly what happened. So let me just give you the quick rundown on Podesta. It was very simple. When they built this campaign, they did not build it with any kind of security in mind. They built it based on convenience. You know, they want to be able to get information around. So people are using different email accounts. They're using um, – they're not taking the proper steps to secure their information. 
And what happened with Podesta, it was very simple. He got a phishing email, and he said, hey, is this legitimate or not? Should I click on this? Because it was about resetting his password on his Google account, his Gmail account. Mm -hmm. Well, the the person who was running lead on some of the tech stuff, it was a, it was a mistake. It was a typo. He, he meant to say it's legitimate or it's not legitimate, and it ended up coming out as it's legitimate. So he clicked on the link. Well, through that link, they were able to reset his password. They were all, also able to harvest information, including passwords he used for his iPhone, which, by the way, while he was sitting on the tarmac in California, uh, the hackers actually got into his iPhone, stole all his data, then wiped his phone. So, I mean, this wow. is how much control you have. And when you have poor password management, all of this could have been solved for five bucks. Right. Seriously. All it would have taken is one account. Per person on something like G Suite, and I don't make any money from G Suite, guys. So I mean, it's I say this because this is what I use. But you've got the ability to lock down devices, uh, track devices. You've got the ability to revoke information, common storage to where you can track. You've got audit trails. You've got two-factor authentication. And I'll tell you the neat thing too about the Google authentication is you can either use the third-party app, and we'll talk a lot more about this later. But think about this: it's a username, a password, and then a, a token that's only good for 30 seconds. And if you don't put that six digits in, then you've got to wait, or then then it recycles, and then you have to put the next set in. Well, the other thing Google's done too that's pretty cool is you can set this up to where it says, "Are you trying to?" It, it'll put a it'll push a notice to your phone. Like I have an iPhone, I have an iPad. Uh, but it'll push it to a trusted device. It goes through a series of, hey, I, we can trust this device. But it physically requires you to press the word yes on there. So in mm -hmm. other words, you just can't intercept it. You actually have to physically press a button that's on displayed on your screen to say, yes, that's me. I'm trying to log in. You know, if they would have just taken a simple step like that up front, taken the extra 30 minutes to an hour to set up their security, we would not know – we would not be hearing about John Podesta. There might be a chance that Hillary would be in the White House, and there wouldn't be this issue about the Russians. By the way, blaming the Russians for the DNC breach and for Podesta's emails is like blaming the car for going left to center when the driver is drunk. Yeah. It's not the car's fault. Yeah, and, when, and part of why I wanted to talk about this today is you know, it's really easy to, to point to Podesta because his name's in the, in the news and because it's a very high-profile – lapse in judgment and, and problem there. But what's, what's really concerning to me and why I want to have this conversation is that I've worked with a lot of campaigns over the years, and I don't know any of them that have taken adequate steps to protect their security, to protect their data. And because, you know, you've got a bunch of vendors, you have a bunch of people working your campaign, and it's really easy to text or email passwords or share stuff or make simple passwords and have them written down in places. And it's all based on convenience, much like you're talking about the problem was with Hillary and Podesta. And, you know, I really believe that more and more we're seeing this be a problem. And people are being targeted that are at much lower levels. Because, you know, back you know, back looking at 2000 with those DDoS attacks, you know, we're talking about things like Yahoo and CNN, very high profile folks. And, and they're still being attacked, There's, but they have much more rigorous, very complex security precautions put in place in, many, in most cases. Well, well, except that, Yahoo. Let's not talk about Yahoo, three billion <laughs> accounts. Yeah. Well, and, and we're, we're hearing stuff about Equifax and the breaches yep. there, and, and all these things are in the news. But what many people forget is that the small fries are getting hit as well. You're, you're having you know, these DDoS attacks in many cases are leveraging you know, these you know, the distributed denial of service attacks. They're actually leveraging you know, smaller computer botnets and stuff to actually go make these attacks. And the way they do that is through a lot of phishing, through some direct hacking, but most of it is, is doing social engineering. It's you know, taking advantage of known easy passwords, some of these things. So let's, let's, before we go into some how we stop this, let's kind of talk about so – you know, kind of go back to the second grade level and talk about like what is phishing? What are the common threat vectors as far as you know, where you get attacked from? Look at you, threat vectors, man. You're talking <laughs> like a pilot. Yeah. Um, well, look, the easiest way if you want to hack a system is to be invited through the front door. Uh, I'll give you a quick backstory because this figures into this. When I was doing this work for Microsoft, um, they, they went on and on about how secure long corporate affairs Building 8 was because that's where Bill Gates was. And that's where I was going to meet these guys. We're having a meeting out there. We're launching a worldwide campaign, et cetera. And I told him, I said, you know, well, nothing is ever secure. Oh, it's, we're, we're, we're pretty locked down here. I said, I'll tell you what, if I can get into our meeting place, which was on the second floor, um, without being escorted in, then you agree to double my invoice. If I can't make <laughs> it in there, I'll do my work for free. 
no, nah, no, nah, we're not going to do that. I said, well, I'll just uh, game on then in any event. So all I did was I sit back and I watched people walk in. I watched how they badged. I watched where their badges were. I looked at the badges, whether they were landscape or portrait. I looked at where they were punched at because what I carried was a set of badges where I could basically make mine look like any one of theirs. Mm-hmm. You know, all you have to do is just kind of have the badge. You hold your hand over it. Well, all I did is I waited until I saw a target come up, which was a young lady holding some coffee. And it, she starts to go to the door and she badges. And I said, here, let me get the door for you. So I, cause she had coffee in her hand, you know, and a computer and another. Mm-hmm. So I held the door open for her cause I was starting to pull my badge out and I just walked right in behind her. That's all it took. You acted like you own it. I can defeat any amount of security you have if you haven't trained your people properly. Right. So, you know, let's kind of work into So the way this works is that phishing is an attack against the person. Now, fish, the difference between fishing and spear fishing is the difference between just throwing your bait in the river and catching what comes along or taking a pole, being out, you know, in a canoe somewhere like you've seen the guys in, you know, in the uh, Caribbean or the other places doing it. It's actually spear fishing. I have an identified target. I have a spear. I'm going after whack. I'm right. going after a particular fish. Well, phishing is easy to do because I can send out a broadcast email. A lot of times those things look like, you know, dear user, dear owner, dear account holder. You know, if you get a message from your bank that says, dear account, you know, owner, you you need to delete it right away because if they don't know who you are and they can't personalize it and show, hey, for your account ending in four digits, whatever your last four of your like credit card are, then you need to delete that right away because there is nothing good. That's a phishing attempt. Yeah. Now, spear phishing. If I was going to spearfish you, Raz, one of the things I'd do is I'd look online. What's your social media presence? I'd, and by the way, this is the number one tactic the Chinese use, the number one tactic the Russians use, the number one tactic the North Koreans use, the Iranians use. I just got through doing a – I was in a um, documentary called True Iran. You can go to trueiran.org. I'm in the trailer. Uh, but I'm in the movie. But we talked about the capabilities of Iran. They're like anybody else. The easiest way into a system is just to walk in through the front door. How do I get into the front door? I socialize you. I get you to click on a link that you shouldn't, open a document, a PDF, a spreadsheet that you shouldn't, and that introduces me into your system. And what it does, it's more more insidious. If I attack your server, I'm still sitting outside what's called the DMC, the the demilitarized zone. I still have to figure out a way to get through the server, get into your network. But if you're answering an email inside your network, you've allowed me inside your DMZ. You've put me inside the wall, and then from there I can move – throughout the whole organization. Right. So spear phishing takes a little bit longer. Um, you know, think of phishing as spam, you know, as direct mail. You're just putting it out there, hope you get 3% return. Mm-hmm. Spear phishing is uh, you go after a high value target. You put a lot of time and effort into it because the whole goal is to get you to trust me. So this could take three to six months, a campaign against you. And then what I want you to do is click on a link, open a document, and now I'm inside your system. And, and part of the, the reason why that's so effective is that in a, in a large organization or something like that, if you're able to, to get in there through one of the, the lower-hanging staffers or something like that, then that still gives you access to other people, and you're able to leverage that against harder targets that are in the network because you're already inside the wall, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's called, you know, once you're inside, you can move laterally now. So once mm-hmm. you're inside, you can move laterally. Um, you can do escalation of privileges or, you know, the other thing, too, is if I can be the person, even the low level staffer and get you to respond to me and I say, look, here's the document. Now I can uh, now I can go after your account because it's coming from a trusted source, which is somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm clicking on this link. So, yeah, the ability to spoof emails, the ability to insert code, the ability to uh, change privileges or escalate privileges for an attacker. Those things all happen. It's much easier to break into a bank when you're inside the vault, you know, than yeah. it is for trying to get outside. So. As far as the, you know, specifically fishing and spear fishing, you know, I mean, I've had, I don't think I've ever been a target of spear fishing, but I've, I've definitely been, you know, had plenty well, of fishing emails. Is, how do you know? Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, I, I've, I've seen a lot of phishing emails come across. Yeah. You know, there are a lot that were popular this last year as far as trying to look like they're from Gmail or something like that. And so I've, I've seen those. I mean, I never click on a link to go to reset any passage or something. I always go directly to that, to what I know is the actual domain rather than going to some Yep. Or something like that. I'll, I'll click, to, you know, right click to unmask the URL and see whether it looks legit or something. But you know, what are some of the things you recommend for folks? Because I think that's probably the biggest area where most of our listeners have to be worried um, is the phishing side. You know, we got to get to password security and that kind of stuff. But on the phishing side, what are some of those major steps that folks should take there? Well, first of all, it's it's number one. Look at the look at how it's written. Most of the phishing uh, 
emails come from places where English is not their first language, and so it looks like crap. It's written bad. The the language is poor. The grammar is poor. Number two, it's addressed not personally. It's addressed, uh, you know, uh, generally, you know, dear user. Um, it will. It'll have you click. It'll say, hey, click the link. The biggest thing you can do is look at the return. First of all, look at where it was sent from and look at the reply to emails and see, you know, like you say, there's depending on whether you're a Mac or Windows machine, but you need to become familiar with how to, like you say, unmask the email address to see where it's really coming from. A phishing attempt that happened in Vermont here not too long ago was sent out to over 500 employees saying it's time to update your W-2. They went to click on a link which looked like it came from the HR department. Instead of the HR department, it was actually a phishing site. Yeah, There was some identity theft there, but what they got more importantly was username and passwords because what did they do? The people thought they were logging into their system, so they right. used the real username, the real password. Well, here's the deal. The, the, ad, the, the email was sent – from you know Vermont HR at Comcast.net, folks. I can assure you, the state of Vermont, the state of Texas, <laughs> or the Republic, they do not they do not have addresses that end in Comcast.net. So <laughs> there's all of these little clues that one thing in and of itself may not indicate it, but when you put it together as a collection, then the red light should be going off. And the other thing too is if you didn't ask for it, never like you say, good practices, never click on the link in the email. Number one, real banks will never say click here to reset your password. Mm -hmm. They won't even talk about your password. They don't even say do this. They'll say, hey, you have a note on our secure system. Go click, you know, go log into our regular system and get it there. Those are the real legitimate ones. But here's the easiest thing too. First of all, what, you know, we get these Nigerian emails. You know, there's there's a prince out there. <laughs> yeah. somebody's got, you know why they keep sending them, Raz? They work. Because they keep working. People keep falling for this. They keep clicking on this. So here's my thing. We're not storming the beaches at Normandy. Nobody dies here. Just delete the email. Right. Look, if it's if it's important, it'll come back a second, even a third time. But a lot of the stuff, if it's in my spam folder, I review it once every, you know, once a week. I just just in case, you know, real legitimate message from something I'm interested in, uh, like from a fundraiser or something is in there. But, you know, trust, you know, set your spam filters, do that stuff. Just don't click on the thing. By the way, if you didn't ask for the information, that's the first indicator. You know, second of all, um, I don't have an account at uh, uh, at uh, a Citibank. I have no accounts at Citibank. When right. I get an email from Citibank <laughs> saying, "Hey, what's going on with your account?" I delete it because uh, there's no, there, I have nothing with Citibank. Yeah, there. I mean, you, you know, there's there's nothing there. There's no point in actually checking into it, et cetera. So, you know, that's that's the number one, I think, threat. Uh, but closely tied to it is the password security side, and you know, part of why I think this is really important is that. You know, I know there was. I think there was one time where I was working with somebody that got one of those phishing emails, and they actually did the password. They went to start resetting their password, and they realized they had just given their password to somebody. Yep. And so they went and they reset their password to that account that they've been trying to get into. And they mentioned it to me, and I was like, "Okay, well, do you use that password anywhere else that's tied to that email?" It's like, "Yes." Well, did you reset those passwords as well? No. Okay, well then get on it because now you've just told those people that email is tied to those accounts and they can probably, especially with social media accounts, stuff like that, they go out there and start trying that username and email that email address and password combination other places and probably get in somewhere else. And then they start asking for password resets and stuff, which helps let them into other areas. So mm -hmm. when it comes to password security, um, you know, we yeah, that's another thing Podesta jacked up. But there are a lot of tools out there. I use LastPass. Uh, there are other ones out there as well. Uh, you know, talk to us about some some best practices when it comes to choosing passwords, keeping it secure, and you know, what you should do in those type of situations. Well, uh, last year the most popular password in the U.S. was one two three four five six, as it was <laughs> the year yeah. before. So that tells you a lot. And we get this from data breaches where we can analyze the passwords and see what people are putting in. But the deal is some people say, well, I use this, I use this. They think it's unique, but it's really not. There's a thing out there called the rainbow table, mm -hmm. and it's a collection of all sorts of different passwords, really, to run a password cracking program. Um, if you've got anything that's in that rainbow table or can be figured out, it's going to be done in a matter of seconds, and that's called a brute force attack. But a lot of times, uh, Sarah Palin actually fell victim to this when she was the uh, vice presidential candidate. They used knowledge-based uh, systems. Basically, they were able to guess questions about her mother's maiden name, which what they did to Colin Powell, which is what they did to John Brennan. Um, and they were able to these like these youths from England were actually able to get into John Brennan's AOL account, Colin Powell's Verizon account. So it is not that tough to do because people would use easily guessable either knowledge-based systems. Or the way, in fact, Lucifer, uh, ones that Catherine Harris, I talked to her extensively about uh, Marcel Lazar uh, called Lucifer. One of the ways he figured out George Bush's password and Colin Powell's password, I'm sorry, is he read their biography. 
Right. And he read, you know, what was your favorite dog and stuff. So it's mm -hmm. simple stuff like that. But let's talk about passwords real quick. Because the other thing I was going to add to the, the fishing, the fishing and the spear phishing definitely are some of the most uh, uh, most efficient tactics, especially spear phishing, because it uses direct knowledge. It calls you out by name. You know, it's it's done some socializing. So you have to be careful with that. When it comes to password managers, except for one that I'm aware of, every other password manager has been breached. So you have to realize that if you do put the password manager up there, um, it's at some point it's going to get breached. In fact, let me tell you uh, real quick here. Um, the company, if I could find it here real quick, well, we won't worry about it. I'll, I'll find it here in a minute. But um, I'm actually, uh, so I wanted to be full disclosure. I'm actually working right now. I was somebody reached out to me from a communications company. They have a company who is a password manager, and it's called Keeper Security. Actually, Keeper Security is the only one I'm aware of that has not been breached at this point. Now they have more users than LastPass and some of the other ones, but they've done a bad job of marketing. So. But you have to be careful with password managers because the other thing you have to be careful of is you've now entrusted somebody else with all the keys to the kingdom. Right. But, but you know what? That is better than nothing. And on the other hand, too, quite frankly, um, even if they do get breached, you know, you're going to hear about it. You just need to make sure, as it suggests with those, you have a different password for everything. Now, I actually have a course. We'll give some freebie stuff away later, but it's called freepasswordcourse.com. I don't use password managers for a couple reasons. Um uh, it's not that I don't trust them, but some of them I don't. Uh, um, but this, that's the tactical negotiation with this company right now. As I say, I don't use them, but if I were to use them, I'd need to understand about how you keep the information secure, what steps you take. Right. Uh, now, let's say that you want to use a password manager. Then you still have to have a good password to secure it. But mm -hmm. let's, take an, let's take an approach. Some people say, well, I've heard now. Uh, well, by the way, the old standards where it says you have to use complex characters, do this, it came out from NIST the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Well, the guy who retired from there basically came clean. He said, I had no idea what I was doing back then. I just wrote it. People adopted <laughs> it as a standard. So it's like, so all of these rules that people have supposedly lived under, like you have to change your password every 90 days, zero proof, zero proof out there that that actually does anything to improve security. In fact, there's lots of evidence to show that it actually decreases the security of your account because what you'd end up doing is using easier passwords because it's tough to come up with all these different accounts to have a variation on the theme, variation on a name. So I tell people don't change your password until you get information that the account's been breached. There's no proof that the second password you get is any tougher to guess than the first one. So don't change things till they get breached. There's another thing out there that says, well, use four words together in a phrase like um, memorial, application, bridge, telegraph. You know, mm -hmm. Well, if you remember those things, it'd be very hard, to, very hard to figure out. Well, here's the problem. Let's say that you've got 30 or 40 accounts, and that's your password. The effectiveness of a password diminishes 50% every time you reuse it. If you're using the same password for your bank as you are for Twitter, as you are for Facebook, you've decreased the effectiveness of it. And the problem is if you use the same password, if one account gets breached, to your point, you have to go back and change all the other accounts now. Right. So what you want to do is have a strategy that says, I have for me, I, in this free password course, uh, freepasswordcourse.com, I teach how to set and remember a strong password through a use of a formula. If you know 2 plus 2 equals 4, then you can figure out how to use my formula because it's, it's, it is really that simple. But it's about coming up with a passphrase, using your formula. To, whether you use my formula or you use a variation on it, doesn't matter. It's just the approach is you use a structured way. But if you do it, I can remember now the passwords to over 40 different accounts I have. It's not written down anywhere. You can search my house. Come on, FBI. Do, well, no, don't. No, 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 FBI. But come search my house. You will not find a single place written down where I have my passwords written down. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I think that for a lot of campaigns and stuff, the having the, the password management tools, you know, one of the reasons I can see those being helpful there is that you are oftentimes sharing access to accounts or having people logging in. And for you know, for some you know, for some companies and organizations, you can have multiple people authorized separately their own logins to be able to contribute to an account or something like that, like Facebook with having multiple admins on a page or something like that. But others, yep. you've got to be able to log in. And so I, I definitely, you know, with myself having a virtual assistant over in the Philippines, uh, I'm able to share password via LastPass with her, but she's, you know, she can never recover what those actually are. So if I needed to lock her out or something like that at some point, right. when there's shift access, I'm able to do that. But she's still able to log into my account until I revoke access, but she'd never be able to reset a password or something like that. And I think so. I think those might provide a utility for campaigns, but 
it would seem, though, that you do get that trade-off, right? You have the potential that they get breached, but you also have, you're able to come to kind of counter that with the potential that you can keep some of these other lower level breaches from occurring uh, you know, with, with, that, with your various passwords. Is that kind of the way you view it or just as far as that trade-off? Yeah, I mean, there's, look, everything is a trade-off. Um, you want more speed um, than you give up. I mean, it's like, for example, you want a, uh, the Japanese Zero was a faster plane, but they gave up armor in exchange for that. Right. So you, you have to make some trade-offs. So but the other thing, too, is finding that squishy middle. It's neither – it's not one extreme or the other. It's, it's in that squishy middle. Like, for example, you with the virtual assistant, the VA, there are ways to set up and manage things like that. In fact, I push a lot of times for uh, – like, uh, for example, ClickFunnels is one of those. And um, uh, 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 MailChimp and uh, ConvertKit or some of the other ones. Mm-hmm. I push these guys to say – and some of them have come up now with you can create separate user accounts to where – they can have like with WordPress. I had people who were helping me build my site and stuff. I could give them access, but I could also restrict what they could do. They couldn't see right. billing financial information. That's what you need to have. So the other thing you have to do is quick tip is go through and make sure that you're using all the security features um, of the application or the online site that you're using. Don't don't because what you don't want to do is give somebody unrestricted access to your information to where they can lock you out. For example, I couldn't. Uh, I did Fox and or I mean I did uh, happening now this morning on Fox. We talked about Russia, but they wanted me to stick around and talk about. I was already gone, but they wanted me to stick around and talk about the fact that Twitter had deactivated Donald Trump's account for 11 minutes. Why? Because one rogue employee was able to go in on his last day and deactivate the account. You cannot put all the keys to the kingdom and allow one person – no one person can fire a missile on a nuclear submarine. Right. No one person can launch nuclear weapons. You know, There's a series of checks and balances. So you need to – and in your campaigns, you need to have checks and balances. And I'm telling you, nobody, not even your most trusted person, no one person needs to have all the keys to the kingdom, and it's not an issue of trust. If that person becomes compromised somehow – whether it's through technical means or through social engineering, if you've invested all of the power into a single thing and there's not a second factor or a second step of authentication, whether it's like to, to spend money or to, to add email accounts or delete email accounts or whatever the case might be, you've now just created a single point of failure, and this is what happened with Podesta. He was, he was the guy that had all the information. All the emails came to him. He stored, Google, you can store tons of information. By the way, if you get one of those phishing emails that says uh, you had a Gmail uh, message bounce or you have a broke, that's, those, those are obviously all fake because nothing ever dies on, you know, in Google. It's there forever. <laughs> right. you know? so, uh, but yeah, that's what's the point. It's all the information was centered in one place. Um, he did not have the security set up beforehand. Look, you can't you, – two seconds before impact, you can't be hoping, gee, you know, I hope this thing has an airbag and maybe I ought to be wearing my seatbelt. Mm-hmm. You need to have all those things in place before the accident happens. Well, and that, you know, that's one of the reasons why I love G Suite. And I mean, I've been using that for years as far as you know, being able to share documents, and I, I recommend it to campaigns across the board. It's, it's cheap. It's reliable. It's a great place to be able to put up – set up your own custom URL and have it all tied in yep. with your systems. You're able to share documents and files and audio, all kinds of stuff uh, via Google Drive. Uh, but the security side is really, really cool because you're able to have, you know, like the if for my for my team, I have to authenticate individually the devices that can log into uh, our G Suite portal as far as mobile devices and stuff like that. And we have two-factor authentication set up for all of our users so that anytime, I mean, it, it does kind of make it a pain because there's a while that I couldn't get one of my, I couldn't get my iPad to be able to log in. It took a little bit of working around, but I got it working and that gave me an added sense of security because, I mean, heck, if I can't hardly log in, then nobody else can either. Well, but here's, here's really, the really thing, cool. Raz. John Podesta now, in hindsight, would have loved to spend an extra 30 minutes to avoid all of this. And that's a lot of people saying, we got to do it now. We got to do it now. No, you don't. Slow down. To go fast, you have to go slow. Slow down. Get it done right so that you can then put your foot on the gas. You're absolutely right. I think that most campaigns in their their desire to get things done quickly really sacrifice a lot when it comes to some basic security precautions. And, and like you said, this is you know when you're not willing to share your password with a vendor or even when you're trusting employees and you're forcing other accounts or different different ways of doing things, that's not saying hey I don't trust you. It's just saying look we're all open to attack and we want to make sure that we you know, we actually protect this campaign. And I think it's 
it's a very, very simple thing. Just like you wouldn't have any one person being able to have unlimited budget to control and having your credit card and use it without right. any type of consideration, um, well, you shouldn't do that with your passwords either because you're open to an actually larger liability in some cases. Your credit card's at least got a limit on it. They're not going to let you go past. When it comes to taking your data and the long-term nature of how they can inflict damage on your campaign, you personally, you know, that's there, there's, uh, there's a lot to lose there. Yeah, it's kind of like being married. I mean, at some point, you know, your wife, you know, you, you do. They, everybody does have mutual access. But guys, this isn't a marriage. This is a business you're talking about running. And so, with a yes. business come rules, just like there are rules of the road. So, with a business, there needs to be rules. And you know what? What makes it easier is if you do it and you're very clear about it up front. It's like when you come on board, you need to have an onboarding process. If you're running a campaign and you got to bring on 50 people, that's great. But if you want it bad, you get it bad. If you just throw them on there and you say, get at it because you can't afford to lose a second, here's what's going to happen. It's, and I love the old – it's the old Red Adair quote because he was talking about if you think it's higher, if you think it's expensive to hire a professional, wait till you hire an amateur. No kidding. If you, hire, if you hire amateurs to help you put your security together and all you're concerned about is getting online, take the extra five minutes a person up front. To get, to get them set up right, like you're saying, get their user accounts set up, make sure they've been trained. Here's the other thing, too. People don't spend time training them on how to use the security features. Everybody ought to be using, if you're using Google, you ought to be using Google Authenticator, let's say, or the uh, Google sign-in, where you have to actually physically, as we're talking about, press the button to acknowledge, yes, I want to log into this. Mm -hmm. Set those things up first, because guess what happens later? Is you sleep better at night knowing is that, hey, um, we've done everything we can. It's kind of out of your hands at that point. It's kind of right. up to G Suite. It's up to Google. But I would <laughs> know that I've got Google spending a few billion dollars behind me making sure their entire site stays secure than me trying to you know, wing this on my own and hoping my cousin Vinny you know, down the corner here who says, hey, I, I did this once. I know guys. You know, No, guys, hope is not a strategy. If you want hope, go to a church. You know, uh, the yellow line does not keep the car on the other side of the road. You've got to put controls in place. You have to put policies in place. And then you need to do spot checks and make sure is everybody following policy. Well, and I, I think you know, at this point, we can kind of back it up a little bit because you know, these steps we're talking about, I don't want listeners to get overwhelmed and think they're going to have to like hire a, you know, a, a chief technology operator or a chief security operator. You know, these are things that you can do with very little time to do them right. I mean, your course you know, uh, is freepasswordcourse.com. Is that right? Yeah, it's it's 15 minutes, uh, four modules. It's very easy to do. I also have there's a couple freebies too when they show up there. Raz, it'll be how to secure my Facebook account, which I, I I promise every campaign needs to make sure they understood how to secure their Facebook account, uh, Instagram. These things take less than 10 minutes. You know, it, to to run through G Suite and set it up properly, even if you're a novice, you can do this in 15 15 to 20 minutes and understand everything you need to do to set up your security correctly. And there's, in such a small amount of time, the protection you can put over yourself, that blanket protection is really incredible. Uh, just being able to understand the background of, of what these things take, what it takes to be secure, and taking some initial steps to secure these main accounts, it, it's going to let you sleep a lot better at night. You're not going to be as vulnerable to, to those kind of problems, you know, the internal or the external. And so I think it's it, it's really one of those things that's a no-brainer, but a lot of people, I mean, the reason that so many people have that one, two, three, four, five, six is the number one password in the U.S. is that people are lazy. So what I'm saying yep. is, I mean, the, really the message I want to hammer home is, guys, don't be that lazy. You're working so hard throughout your business, throughout your campaign, throughout your personal life. You need to, you need to take those couple minutes to actually secure these things because you stand to lose so much if you're attacked and breached. Yep. No, uh, and people, again, we can, we trade uh, uh, security for convenience. We want it to be convenient. So we just, we get into the car. We don't put our seatbelts on. We don't change our windshield wipers when we should. Oh, I just don't have time for that. But yet then when we're in the rainstorm and my mm -hmm. windshield wipers don't work and we're about to have an accident and I'm going, oh, if I'd only, you know, if only, if only, if only, well, you know, there's a lot of if onlys out there. Yeah. If only, hey, guys, think about this. Seriously, think about this for a minute. If only John Podesta and their campaign had set up their security correctly from the start, the only way in the Russians had was through spear phishing. Mm -hmm. That's the only mechanism. And if it was set up and everybody was trained properly to say, never respond to a request like that, you let us know and we'll handle it, we wouldn't be having this discussion, at least about Podesta and the emails, because they would not have made they – wouldn't, they wouldn't have been compromised. Because when you, it's very tough, I'm going to tell you. It, it's very tough, and you can only attack something for so long before it raises the red flag. People say, oh, somebody's trying to break in. But if I can get trusted access, the system doesn't know I'm not trusted. The system doesn't know I'm a Russian hacker. 
all they see is somebody's got the username and the password, and they're trusted, and they log in. Well, and like you said at the beginning, talking about this not being about R's and D's, when you look across the spectrum of powerful people, I mean, John Podesta is no idiot. I don't like his politics, but he's not an idiot. When you look at John Podesta, Colin Powell, George Bush, and all these high-profile people that have been breached in the last several years, uh, this is not about a, a partisanship. This is not about whether you're smart or not. It's whether you take a few simple precautions. And if you do, then you're not going to be on those headlines. You're not going to be getting breached. You're not going to have your emails right. spread about there. Um, you're not going to be losing access to important things at critical points in your campaign. And the people that are you know, talking about getting hacked, this is not, in most cases, going to be your opponent or somebody that actually cares about politics doing the attacking. This could be somebody that just wants your bank account information, wants to steal money from you or do identity theft. But their ability to to do race and just wreak havoc once inside would yeah. lock you out of different things. It, it can really mess things up. And so I think both on the personal side and the campaign side, which admittedly get kind of mil- melded together in a campaign, you really need to start taking some of these basic steps to, to talk about this with your campaign team and, and really just get a little bit more secure. Well, you bring up – there's an excellent point there that you bring up, and we need to just kind of drive this home. If you have – if 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 you are a poor driver in your personal life and I hire you to drive my UPS truck, you're going to be a poor driver in that UPS truck too. Yes. Your habits go from one place to the other. But let's look at it this way. But if I improve your habits at work, in other words, like at UPS, I send you to a driving course. I teach you how to drive, which is what we would do with our troopers, you know, our police officers. Send them how to drive. They ended up becoming better drivers in their personal life. So it does go both ways. But look, if you bring bad habits to the table, what's the old saying? You know, you lovers of football down there in Texas, you know, you're going to play like you practice. If you practice right. halfway, you're going to play halfway. So you got to play like you practice. And that means from a campaign from day one, you need to understand, number one, you are under attack. Every minute of every day, whether it's directly or indirectly, somebody's either looking to exploit you, get into your campaign, or they're looking to exploit the technology that you use because they're generally just scanning for vulnerabilities. And if it happens to be you, even so much the better. The more high profile you become, the more controversial issues that you take on, the more that you're in the news, the more that you raise your profile and somebody's going to want to attack you. That means spear phishing uh, emails. That means – uh, attempts to figure out who runs your site, you know, where it's being run out of. Uh, look, one of the biggest bank heists, or actually money heists of all time, it's called uh, Business Email Compromise. Uh, it was $97 million, Southern District of New York. We're waiting to figure out who the company is, but the way they did it was very simple. This company had a third party process all their payments. The hacker, all they had to do, the, the scammer, all they did was send a request to the third party, say, hey, guess what? Made it look like they spoofed it, made it look like it was come from the company, say, hey, we're changing our bank. Here's new information. Oh, great. It was a bank on the eastern edge of China. For a week, all the money from this company, they were processing, as you can tell, in a week, $97 million, massive amount of money went wow. to another location. That's how simple it is to do. I don't have to break in. I just get you to do it for me. Mm-hmm. Wow. that's a, I hadn't heard about that. That is – that is very, very smart, incredibly devious. Obviously, it was effective. That's that's crazy. And what they did is, I'm telling you right now, third parties are security holes. So all of you campaigns out there, listen up. If you're using third parties, you need to treat them as security holes, which means you need to do extra due diligence. If somebody, if some third party, a consultant or somebody else is going to have access – Do as Raz said. Get yourself a G Suite account or something similar. Make sure that they have an email address that you can control, that you can see so that you can limit things, that you can audit things. You can give them access to things. You want to know if they delete stuff. You want to know if they add stuff, whether you use that or something like Dropbox for business. Get something that's commercial grade. Get something that's purpose built for doing what it is you want to do. I mean I would suggest you use things like even Slack for internal communications. Mm -hmm. You know, and do things like that to where now you have keep as much stuff off of email as you can, put more stuff in the transactional messaging and things like Slack. But you can tie all these things together. You can add your applications. But now you've put the onus, in a sense, you know, on um, a communication provider. Now, somebody say, well, isn't that a third party? It, different third party. We're talking about somebody that you bring it into your environment, that you give access, that can actually do things. We trust, you know, hey, look, I trust G Street. Why? Because if they try to do something to me, they got to do it to a million other users, for example. Right. You know, yeah, you're going up against a pretty big budget of, of Google trying to maintain their reputation, keep yeah. things secure. Yeah, and it's just like we found out from Twitter, right? I mean, uh, now, look, that was – I mean, I you can figure out the politics of the employee who deactivated the account. But I'm telling you right now, if it wasn't for Donald Trump, Twitter would be out of business. 
because <laughs> yeah. think, think about the branding. Think about the, every time they talk about it, Donald Trump just said on Twitter, uh, how much money do you think it would cost to be able to get that kind of marketing and advertising? <laughs> no I mean, doubt. wouldn't you like somebody saying, well, in your campaign, Raz Schaefer said, uh -huh. that's, I mean, think about the branding that would get you. Maybe we should try doing that. I'll that's do that idea. next time I'm on Fox. I'll say, yeah, yeah. well, according to Raz Schaefer, <laughs> my campaign, but, I like it. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Definitely run with that. And do the whole Ted Cruz thing. Just you know, make sure you repeat the URL three times. <laughs> we always give Ted a hard time. He, I, I loved it. He did it every time he was on the campaign stump. Talking about his website, he would make sure he said TedCruz.org, TedCruz.org, TedCruz.org. Well, you know sure why? got it. You know why the rule of three? It's it's human learning. When you mm -hmm. listen to a radio ad, how many times did they repeat the telephone number? Three times. Three times. How many pigs, how many little pigs were there? Three little pigs, right? Yep. You know, three the big bad wolves, you know, three little wolves. I mean, everything comes in three. So, yeah, you're right. You repeat it three times. By the way, I, I, sh I sent you that picture right that night. I was uh, met Ted Cruz. We're at Fox together. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Dude, yeah, I'm, I'm connected. I know people. They don't know me, but I know them. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, do you have any, uh, any other war stories you want to share with us before we start wrapping up? Look, I will tell you, some of the best war stories are ones that you're never going to hear about in the news because um, they affect they affect everyday people, you know, like you and I and other folks um, that are losing their identity, looking losing their bank accounts, simply because people are exploiting basic, common, fundamental mistakes. Um, if you take that free password course and literally, it's all free. There's a couple courses on there, and in fact, I have a more extensive course where uh, you'll see it. It's all on the same page where you go to freepasswordcourse.com. That's freepasswordcourse.com. One more time, that's freepasswordcourse.com. <laughs> see, I said it three times. There you go. There's also I have a, a five week academy. The first week is free, so you can see you can look through there and say, hey, that's something I want to learn. Now in the academy, it's more extensive. It's about four and a half hours of training. I go very deep on this stuff, including step by step how to set up your Google Suite stuff. But then I've got some free stuff there. This is you know really what I'm doing is is designed as is how do we help? By the way, there are 28 million small businesses in the United States. Out of those 28 million, one out of five every year gets attacked. That's 5.6 million. Out of those 5.6 million, 60 percent, 3.4 million go out of business. Out of the number of businesses that are employee-based, in other words, they're not just solo practitioners, but they actually employ people, small business generates more jobs than anybody else. Mm -hmm. You are, when you're a campaign, you're a small business. People depend yes. upon you for their livelihood. So you have to take that trust seriously. And that means from the start, in fact, Raz, I was just thinking of something. This might be something maybe we should talk about later. But, you know, you talk about how to set up a campaign. One of the, one of the, one of the, th stools, the, uh, the legs of the stool that ought to be set up is how to set up your security right from the start. Do it from day one. Trust mm -hmm. me, folks, it's easier. It's easier to build your house when you've already dug your foundation, you've poured the walls for the basement than it is to go back in and dig out that basement later. So, you know, you set it up from the start and when everybody comes on board, it's a checklist. And so last, you know, it's, it's literally, don't try and remember it all. It's a checklist. We brought them on board. We did this. We did this. We, we give them your 10 minute, 15 minute training. Show them how to, don't tell them they have to set a password. Show them how to set one. Yes. Show them how to configure their phone. Show them how to do things. See one, do one, teach one. And then they will do it. But you know, but probably last war story, I'll tell you probably the most, uh, one of the most interesting ones. Um, it's some of this information isn't common knowledge uh, right now, but, um, because people haven't dived down. So I do a, right now I do a keynote called Cyber Strike, Warfare in the Fifth Domain. It's about how Russia will invade Ukraine in the future and how they will do it through a use of offensive cyber operations and military maneuvers, and they will take over the country of Ukraine without firing a shot. And what people don't realize, so I'll give you this war story and we'll, we'll close on this because this will give this this is why you folks need to pay attention to what's going on in the world. I don't know if you remember this, Roz, but back in December 23rd, 2015, we had the first attack of black energy. It was the one that took out 700,000 homes in western Ukraine completely without power. It took three power stations and two substations offline. Mm -hmm. People – but nobody looked behind that. They, you know, they said – well, they looked, at the, they looked at what happened. They didn't look at the date. Well, me being the inquisitive type, I started looking at the date of what happened. Well, do you know what happened exactly one year before that, December 23rd, 2014? What's that? The Ukrainian parliament voted 330 to 72, I believe it was, to change their status from non-aligned to aligned. Now, why that's significant is that if you want to join NATO, you have to become an aligned nation. Mm -hmm. What's the last thing Russia wants on its southern border? Oh, NATO country. Is a NATO country. 
So nobody looked at the, the significance of this is that this was very – how do we know the Russians were behind it? Because it is – look, it is not without coincidence, Comrade, that it happened exactly when you're today. But then the question I had then, but then why that dam? Why not another? Well, then you have to go back to history to August of 1941, Operation Barbarossa, which was Hitler's plan to invade Russia called Operation Barbarossa. As German forces were moving through Ukraine and through Kiev, Joe Stalin, Uncle Joe um, – by the way, Joe Stalin famously said one time, he said, one death is a tragedy, but a million deaths is a statistic. That's how to give you guys an idea about their thinking about what they do. So what he wanted to do was slow down the advance of the German army is he blew up the Zaporizhia Dam uh, on the Dnieper River. So when I show these folks today the actual dam – and I show them pictures back from 1941 where the holes are. It's the exact same dam. And then I found footage of this where they're actually blowing up the dam. Well, they didn't just blow up the dam. They killed over 100,000 Ukrainians. So what did Russia do? They blew up the dam back then. They killed some Ukrainians. They attacked the same dam again in 2015, one year to the date after they Ukraine decided they wanted to join NATO. And so you know, I, I kind of leave you with that to say, look. People think there is more. This is not just all about ones and zeros. There are really people behind this thinking about what do I do to you? So if you're a campaign, you need to start thinking differently about, well, what would somebody do? Why would somebody do something to us on this date? You know, or what are some of the key dates for us? Was it the date that you filed the run for office? Was it the date that you made some big announcement? Was it the date that something happened? You know, you've got to look behind the thing and start figuring out what's going on here. Because at some point, if you raise your profile high enough, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, um, uh, you know, some of these players out there, they're going to target you. Why? Because they because that's what they do. You, leopards don't change their spots. Leopards are who they are. The Russians, the Chinese will continue to uh, attempt to uh, get into our systems, collect information, intellectual property, commit espionage. Russia definitely. By the way, last point here. People start talking about how Russia interfered in the election. Russia didn't interfere in the election. They influenced the election, which is something, by the way, we've been doing for lots of years when we try to prevent the spread of communism in Latin America. Read any CIA director's biography, and they will tell you their memoirs. They will tell you about how much money we spent in Latin America. The difference is between influence and interference, the difference between an espionage objective and a uh, violation of sovereignty. So – not you know, there's not one vote that was changed in this election. But what happened was, if I can change what we talk about and who we talk about, I get all this free money and free coverage, either positively or negatively, that I didn't pay for. So you can see it's like putting a you know magnifying glass on you. I can either enlarge what you do, or like an ant, I can fry you with it. So you, that's why you've got to be careful because the internet out there is this huge magnifying glass. You need to make sure. That you're, you, that you're set up properly so that you don't become the little ant that's getting fried by it. And that's what happened to Podesta. These guys got fried as big as they thought they were. Uh, they still – they fell victim to some very small basic trade craft. And now we'll be talking about this, and we'll be talking about their failures for year to come, not their uh, successes. Well, and I think that you know, for some of the folks that are like, you know what, I'm just running for state rep or for state senator or something like that. They're like, I'm not a target. And one of the things that I think may become a bigger concern in the future is folks that will be hacked and then they won't do anything with it for a long time. It'll kind of be a sleeper situation where they have access, but they're not going to exploit it for as long time because they're like, you know what, this guy might be a congressman someday, and maybe he'll keep the same Gmail account, and maybe we can leverage that for a bigger payoff down the line when he's emailing about other stuff or you know whatever they're doing down the line. You'll let it sleep for a while and then be able to target them, actually leverage that, that information and that breach down the line. And so you, know, you got to be able to be establishing some basic security practices here at the get-go so that you can be secure and make sure that you're not a target down the line because mistakes you make today can hurt you down the line even if you know, it's not a near-term attack. Well, let, let me – last point on that too, Raz. You may think that you're just a state senator or just somebody running for office until the point of which you are a key vote in – you may not be targeted by Russia. You can be targeted by – GPS or Fusion GPS or somebody else like that, somebody who's trying to collect opposition research. You happen to support the president or the uh, the state senate, you know, or some key figure. Look, you can never predict wh why somebody's going to attack you. I, I can't predict why somebody would want to come break into my house. Other than it's there's obvious reasons why people generally burgle a house. But the point about it is, you need to have your shields up all the time, just like the Spartan warriors. Keep your shields up because it's not the question of when you're going to become. A target. It's a question of: Is it your family? Is it? Will they? Do they want to ruin your reputation? 
you know and I know for politicians, it's about the reputation. It's about what people think about them and what they perceive about them. And if I can negatively influence that in any way, which is, oh, I've got pictures of your candidate that he kept on his phone or her phone. You know, it, it, you might have done something five years ago. And to your point, if I still access your phone, I can pull down those pictures. I won't use them today because they don't have any value. I'm waiting right. until until the race is close, and then I can put this information out there. Look, it, and again, it won't be the Russians. It could be uh, somebody else who's less than, net, less than ethical working for a different campaign. You need to just look at it this way. Is you've got to defend yourself regardless of who's coming after you. You, just, you don't get to pick and choose. You've got to defend against everything. You're 100% right. Well, guys, look out for Morgan Wright on Fox News, around the web. Morgan, where can folks find you on Twitter and uh, give us your URL another three times? All right. Well, um, I'll save you the benefit of that. So it's just <laughs> it's morganwright.us. That's morganwright, first name, last name, dot us. Um, you can get me on Twitter at morganwright underscore us, uh, at morganwright underscore us. Um, and that's probably the best two ways to, you know, to get a hold of me. I, I tweet stuff, you know, every day. So I, every day there's about five to six tweets that come out where I'm looking at some of the things that are going on. My professional site has, uh, if you, if you, if you want me to speak at your event or talk things, you can do that too. I do strategy work. Um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things, I have some things that I'm working on, but that's the best way to get a hold of me. And of course, anytime you need something, get a hold of Raz. Raz and I see each other at least every week. So you can get a hold of us that way too. Morgan, I really appreciate it. Guys, I hope you'll take advantage of some of these tips and tricks that Morgan has shared and keep yourself from becoming a front page story with some kind of failure like John Podesta had. I don't want to see that out of any of y'all, and you don't either. So take some of these precautions and make sure you don't become a front page problem. Morgan, have an awesome time. Listeners, thank you guys so much for making this an awesome year to run this podcast. We got many more to come. I'm having a blast, and we're not stopping anytime soon. So keep downloading, keep reviewing, keep liking us on Facebook, and we'll talk to you guys again next week. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.